So two weeks ago, I started a new series called Origin Story. And superhero movies often begin with an origin story. We wonder, well, how did this person get their superpower? And an origin story answers that question. So I have a little bit of a quiz here, a superhero origin stories quiz. And for some of you, this quiz will be really easy. You might get them all right. Probably many of you will. Some of you might, you might not know any of the answers. So uh, let's try this. Superhero origin stories. And uh, the first one, which superhero, <clears throat> excuse me, which superhero was born Cal-El on the planet Krypton? Okay, let's see the answer, Lance. Superman. There he is. Uh, number two, many of you got that one. Which superhero was once, a hi- was once hired by the military to develop a gamma bomb? Maybe this one's a little more difficult. That's, that was his original name. What was he known as a superhero? The Hulk, right. That's the answer. Number three, which superhero was born on Paradise Island, an isolated location in the middle of the ocean? You might say that. This is according to Wikipedia. <laughs> Maybe this is a little more obscure fact. Let's see the answer, Lance. Wonder Woman. All right, number four. Which superhero vowed to rid his city of crime after the murder of his parents? That one is Batman. A little more easy. Uh, next one. Which superhero built a powered suit to escape a group of terrorists? Iron Man is the answer. Number six, which superhero was a recipient of the super soldier serum? Captain America. We got two more. Uh, Which superhero was once a Russian spy? Black Widow is the answer. Some of you knew that one. And finally, which superhero was once a neurosurgeon? Doctor Strange is the answer. So those are some origin stories to uh, superheroes. Usually the movie starts with that origin story. How did they get that superpower? Well, when Jesus was walking on this earth about 2,000 years ago, people wondered how he was able to do the things that he did. And the Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they give us the origin story of Jesus. They answer that question, how did Jesus get all of this power? How was he able to do the miracles that he did? How was he able to rise from the dead? Well, we have the origin story. Uh, In Luke chapter 1, the passage that that, uh, Benjamin read, Mary asks Gabriel, when Gabriel comes to see her, he appears to her and tells her that she's going to give birth to a baby boy and name him Jesus. And the angel tells her about uh, what this baby will be like when he grows up. Uh, Mary asks the angel, how will this be? How is this possible? How is this going to happen? And I want you to see how Gabriel answers Mary. Verse 37. He says, for nothing will be impossible with God. What will be impossible with God? Nothing. Nothing will be impossible with God. Now, it's impossible for you and me to fly. You know, if we need to put the star on the top of the 100-foot tall Christmas tree, we can't fly up there and uh, do that. But that's a job that someone like Superman could do. He can fly, and uh, what's impossible for us is possible for him. Of course, he's not a real person. He's a fictional character. But if he were real, he could fly up to the top of that tree and put the star up there. Uh, Superman would say, flying, that's nothing. That's easy. For him, flying is easy. For us, it is impossible to fly on our own without getting an airplane or doing something like that. So there are some things that are impossible for us. For Superman, though, he could fly. But there are even impossible things for Superman. 
However, impossible is nothing for God. Impossible things are easy for God. There's some words up on the screen. I want us to say these together. Impossible is nothing for God. Let's try it again. Impossible is nothing for God. One more time. Impossible is nothing for God. So that's my main point this morning. If you don't remember anything else, impossible is nothing for God. That's what the angel tells uh, Mary. Nothing will be impossible with God. In other words, impossible is nothing for God. Impossible things are easy for God. So in Luke 1, verses 26 through 38, I see three impossible things. First of all, Mary was given an impossible task. Now I have a question for you. Maybe some of the younger ones would dare to answer this question. How old do you think Mary was when she was given this news about her giving birth to Jesus? Anyone like to guess how old she was? Simon's thinking about it. No one wants to Derek make a guess? 15? 115? <laughs> 16? All right. Let's do some pretty good guesses. Well, we're given a, a clue here because we're told that Mary was a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. So she was betrothed, which means that she was sort of like our engagement. She was engaged to this guy named Joseph. Now, in that culture, you were very young, usually when you were engaged to be married. You could be as young as 12 years old. The, the norm was 12 to 14. So you think about some of the the young ladies who participated in our service so far, uh, Hannah and Sophie and Angel, Mary would have been right, probably right in that age group. So that's something to think about. So if she were in this church, she probably would hang around with girls of that age. So some of us might think of her as maybe 16 or 18 or 20 or older. Uh, this was her first child. She was engaged to be married if she was like all the other girls in that culture, she would have been married quite young. So a very young girl. And some of us adults might look at someone Mary's age and say, she's just a kid. But, but God didn't see her as just a kid. He chose her to be the mother of our Savior. You could say that really she had the most important task of anyone on the earth at that time. God chose this very young girl. So that tells us that you don't have to wait to reach a certain age to start serving the Lord. You know, in, in Nova Scotia, there are a lot of jobs you can't do unless you are a certain age, sometimes 16. Uh, they say, well, come back when you're 16, and then we'll talk about you getting that job. Uh, but the angel didn't say, Mary, wait until you turn 16, and then God has a task for you. No, God had chosen her for this task right then. So if you're Mary's age, 12, 13, 14, or even younger, you're not just a kid at church. We shouldn't see you as just a kid. And there are ways that you can serve the Lord right now. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, we've seen some uh, up here serving the Lord through participating in worship, uh, but that's not, of course, the only way. There are other ways you can serve the Lord here in the church, maybe not up front, maybe doing other things. You can serve the Lord in your home uh, by the kind of son or daughter you are. You can serve the Lord in, in uh, your school, uh, in your neighborhood, by being uh, the kind of person that God wants us to be, to be kind to others, to help others, to, to be a witness uh, for uh, Christ, to live the way He wants us to live, invite others to church or youth group or whatever. And so there are all sorts of ways when we're young and when we're old 
and in between that we can serve the Lord. We don't have to wait till we're a certain age. We can do that right away. And that was the case with, with Mary. And to Mary, probably this task seemed impossible. But the angel told her, the Lord is what? He's with you. And that means that he would give to Mary the strength she needed to be the mother of Jesus. So we shouldn't ask in doubt, how am I going to do this? This is impossible. Instead, we should ask in faith, wonder in faith, how is God going to help me to do this? I know that this is something I should do, he wants me to do. Maybe it seems impossible, but God is going to give me the strength to do this. And that's how it was with Mary. She didn't understand everything that the angel said, but that's what she did. She said, behold, in verse 38, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. So really the most important thing we need is just the willingness to serve. To just say, I'm willing to do that. Uh, it might seem difficult or hard or even impossible, but I just need to be willing to obey, and then God will take care of the rest. And that's true for us, for those of you who are young and those of us who are not so young. So Mary was given an impossible task, but, let's say it together, impossible is nothing for God. An impossible task. Second, the birth of Jesus was an impossible task birth. So let's remember that this story is really about Jesus. He's the main character of the story. Now Mary is an important character, but she really is a secondary character. She's, she's playing a supporting role. Uh, it's like with the Spider-Man movies. Uh, who's the main character? The movie's called Spider-Man, so he must be the main character. Is Aunt May the main character? No, she's an interesting character, uh, but not the main character. She plays a supporting role. Now, maybe there will be someday a, a movie about Aunt May, and Spider-Man will be uh, in a supporting role, but Spider-Man is the main character of that movie. So it's mainly about him, and that's true of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, we're told something about Mary here, her important role in the birth of Jesus and his life, but it's really about him. And so since he is the main character in the Gospel of Luke, uh, let's look at what the angel says about Jesus. Verse 31 through 32. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name what? Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Now, if you were given that news, you would probably ask the same question that Mary asked. How will this be? How is this possible? What the angel is talking about is impossible. How will Mary, a virgin, an unmarried woman, how will she uh, right away conceive in her womb, and how will she have this child? And what the angel says about this child uh, is really something that I'm sure amazed her. So how is this possible? How will this be? Well, then Gabriel talks about another impossible birth that will soon happen, the birth of, do you know who it is? Not Jesus, but someone who was born before Jesus. It was John. We call him John the Baptist. Verse 36 and the angel answered her after she said, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. Uh, there will be something miraculous happening. And the power of the Most High will, will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, someone who was unable physically to have a baby, she in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. And so how are these births possible? The birth of John to a barren woman, Jesus, born to a virgin. How are these births possible? The angel says in verse 36, because nothing will be impossible with God. So the birth of Jesus was an impossible birth, but, say that together, impossible is nothing for God. The impossible is easy for God. He is the all-powerful God, the creator of this world, able to do what 
the angel promised to Mary would happen. And then finally, the third impossible thing, humanity has an impossible problem. Now, what name does Gabriel tell Mary to name her baby boy? It's Jesus. We read that. Now, does anyone know what the name Jesus means? Okay. I don't know if you know what your name means. Does anyone know what their name means? Any of the kids know what your name means? I don't know what all my I look what my the names of all my kids mean. Uh, I know that Sophie is short for Sophia, which is a Greek word for wisdom. You find it in the New Testament. Uh, Lacey comes from a last name from France. Uh, maybe you know your name. Maybe when you were naming your child, you looked up the meaning of the name, and that was significant in giving the child that name. Jesus has a significant name. I think I heard it from some. Uh, it, has, uh, it, it really means the Lord saves. We're given a, a hint. I was going to mention this if you had trouble getting the answer uh, in a dream. Over in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 21, uh, Joseph was told that Mary will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. Why? For or because he will save his people from their sins. So the name Jesus has something to do with saving people from their sins. And Jesus means the Lord saves. So Jesus was born to save us. His name was significant. And so this has to do with our impossible problem. And two weeks ago, I mentioned, should we, uh, should we call Jesus a superhero? We talked about superheroes and origin stories and the origin story of Jesus. Should we call Jesus a superhero? Perhaps that sounds a little irreverent when we think about the other superheroes, but he is super. Jesus is super. He does possess abilities beyond those of ordinary people. Uh, he is a hero. Of course, he uses his power for good. And so I wouldn't call him a superhero. I would call him the superhero. He is the one born to save us. Our impossible problem is that we are sinners. We've, we've broken God's law. We've disobeyed what the Bible says. All of us have done that, myself included, and our sin separates us from God. But thankfully, God loves us, and He wants us to know Him. He wants us to live with Him forever in heaven. And so Jesus came into this world to live the life that I couldn't live, a perfect life, and to die the death I deserved to die. I deserved to be punished for my sins, but Jesus on the cross was punished in my place. That's what we mean when we say he died for us, for our sins. We're sinners. We deserve punishment from God. We deserve hell, not heaven. But thankfully, again, God loves us. Jesus was sent into this world. He lived the life we couldn't live, and he died the death we should have died. And so humanity, we have an impossible problem, but the Word of God says if we put our trust in what Jesus has done for us, if we say, I can't be perfect, I am a sinner, the Bible says, and if we trust in what Jesus has done for us, if we believe it, and we trust in that to save us, to forgive us of our sins. The Bible says our impossible problem is taken away. So humanity, we, we have an impossible problem. But, let's say it together, impossible is nothing for God. So three impossible things in this story. First, Mary was given an impossible task. But impossible is nothing for God. You might think, well, I'm not able to do much, or I'm just young, or I'm too old, or uh, you know, I'm not very talented. Uh, the Lord has something for you to do, a way to encourage or help others in the church and outside the church. Uh, these things might seem impossible to us, but nothing is impossible with God. Uh, second, the birth of Jesus was an impossible birth, physically impossible, a virgin birth, but Let's say it again. Impossible is nothing for God. And then third, humanity, we have an impossible problem, our sin. We couldn't take care of the problem. We couldn't solve it. But Jesus died for our sin in our place. And we've put our faith in him. We believe in what he's done for us. Then we will be 
saved. He was born to save us. So we have an impossible problem, but let's say it one more time. Impossible is nothing for God. Is impossible something for God? No. Impossible is nothing for God.